His right is that I should serve him. His right is that I should honor him. I should do my tasks that I've agreed to do for him and nothing more. I should not betray his rights. Can you see? Hukuq al-Ibad, my friends, for those of you who study fiqh or interest in Sharia studies, is fundamental to the Sharia. The rights of fellow human beings. It's a non-negotiable. It's, part of, it's fundamentally part of our Sharia. Human rights, human dignity. So he recognizes his master too. What a beautiful verse, isn't it? Already we haven't even finished with the verse. We haven't even finished with the verse. He recognizes Allah's help. He needs Allah's help. Then he says to her, he gives her nasiha. Don't do this. And the way he gives her nasiha is, look, this is not good to do. And we are betraying the rights of another human being. In this one phrase, you see the huququllah and huququl ibad all together. In this one phrase, إِنَّهُ رَبِّي أَحْسَنَ مَسْوَاءِ إِنَّهُ لَا يَفْلِحُ ظَالِمُونَ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ نَحْمَدُهُ وَنُسَلِّ عَلَى رَسُولِهِ الْكَرِيمِ أَمَّا بَعْدُ السَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ الحمد لله. Verse number twenty-three is the verse that we are looking at. إن شاء الله تعالى. Beautiful discussion taking place in the twenty-third verse of the Quran. I want you to pay attention. Because what I'm going to share with you today, inshallah, is going to answer a lot of questions non-Muslims have and Muslims have about the sanctity and protection of the Anbiya from sin. One of the fundamental things in Islam as Muslims is that the person that gives us knowledge, that we take knowledge from, especially if he's a prophet, he must be protected from sin. Because if he's sinful, or if he does sin, then how can we trust what he says? You understand this? Very, very important. So I'm going to unlock this for you, inshallah ta'ala today. Because people might say, how can you trust this prophet, or any prophet, or any person, who tells you about Allah, or tells you about your deen, and there might be some doubts about his integrity. So we're going to look at that inshallah today. But you're also going to learn inshallah some Arabic alongside this. Even if you don't know Arabic, you're going to learn some Arabic inshallah ta'ala with me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves the story on. It's a very, very interesting part of the story. Remember what happened last week. Yusuf alayhi salatu salam has been purchased. He's come into another household in Egypt. And now he's in this particular household and a woman comes into the story. A woman enters the story here. Now, before we go into the story, I must caution us that although Allah is talking about a woman here, and we will see that she tries to entice him, she tries to lure him, we must not take this to say that women are bad. Very, very important. That women are somehow temptations, or somehow they are evil. Allah doesn't mention this in the Quran. So we must make this very, very clear. Because sometimes I've heard when I was younger, some people used to say, you know, Allah said this about Hawa, Allah said this about, Allah didn't say anything bad about women. The sin is their own sin, irrespective of the gender. There are men in the Quran who do bad things. As you know about Fir'aun, wa Haman, wa But there are also women in the Quran who do very good things. So it's not about gender. It's not about them being male or female. It's not that somehow females are bad. Or it's not somehow that males are bad. So we must move this culture, this way of thinking in Islam. We don't have this in Islam. In other religions, they might have this. They might say that, oh, it was a fault of Hawa or Eve that Adam was made to come out of Jannah or he was kicked out of Jannah. Number one, Allah does not mention any fault of Eve or Hawa alayhi salatu salam. Number two, they were not kicked out of Jannah according to our tradition. Because we don't have a concept of original sin. No one is born, like in certain strands of Christianity, that people are born with sin. We don't believe in this. So we must make our aqidah very, very clear at the outset. So Allah says, verse number 23, There's different translations, I'll give you two. And the lady in whose house he lived, tried to seduce him. She locked the doors firmly and said, come to me. Haytala, come to me. Mufti Shafi Sab in his tafsir gives a nice translation which I like as well. 
and she in whose house he was seduced him, seduced him away from his self and bolted the doors and said, come on. So she locked him in the room and she said, come on, let's do something immoral. What does Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam say? Qala ma'adha Allah. Allah is my refuge. Innahu rabbi ahsana maswai. It is not right to betray my master. Here the word rabbi, he's talking about his master. In those days they would say, that, of course, we can't say that today, but in those days they will say that. Innahu Rabbi Ahsana Maswai. It's not my right to betray my master. He's brought me here to do khidmah, to serve the family. I shouldn't betray his trust. Innahu la yuflihu zalimun. Indeed, the wrongdoers never succeed. Beautiful verse, lots to be discussed here. Here we see, my friends, how the wife of Aziz sought to seduce Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. The name most people would say is Zulaikha, but Allah does not give us a name in the Quran. And to be honest, it doesn't really matter what's her name. It doesn't really matter what's her name because Allah only in the Quran tells you what you need to know, like I've told you many, many times before. So we should not get lost in the details. Of course, it's important, but what is Allah actually telling us? What does Allah want us to do? So Allah does not provide us with more details about her and rather prefers to focus on the fact that Yusuf والسلام, lived in her house. So Allah is telling you something very important, that he lived in her house. She was responsible for him and he was responsible to doing their khidmat. And we see that Yusuf والسلام, in his attempt to save himself from sin, because she tried to seduce him, in addition to being locked in, this matter was further complicated by the fact that he lived under her protection and authority. In other words, he was in a very awkward situation. If you think about power, he's just brought into the household. If he doesn't resist her, right, or he does what she wants, then he's going to be doing what she wants him to do, and she has the authority to do that. If he doesn't do it, he's in problems, he's going to get into trouble. So he finds himself in a very awkward situation. You must understand, that's why Allah is saying he was in her house. The Quran is very, very precise. Every word matters. In her house, fi baytiha. And Allah is mentioning that she locked the door, so he was trapped. He was in a situation of what we would say today of not his wanting. He found himself in that situation. We call this fallenness. He was there. There's nothing he can do. And that any attempt him from by him to decline her seduction could lead to consequences for him. So he's in a very awkward situation, alayhi salatu wasalam. He did not choose to be in the situation. But what was his reaction is beautiful. You see three things that happen here. Teen Chizo, you will see here. Number one, you see that number one, his reaction you will see was God-centered, Allah-centered. Allah was at the center of his reaction. Number two, he responded like a prophet should respond. We'll see this inshallah. And number three, he also, while he was responding, made sure that he recognized the rights of others. These three things are central in how we should live in the world. These three things are central to how we should live in the world. I'm going to unpack that for you now. First, when this problem came, what did he do? Look at the Quran. Look at the verse. What did he do? What's the first thing he said? Allah. He turned to Allah. Awwal. Awwalan. He turned to Allah. He, there's nothing else in the Quran. He turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ma'adh Allah, Allah is my refuge. I'm in this difficult situation. Allah put me in this test. Allah, only you can take me out of this difficulty. So we must be content with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather than saying, why did you put me in this situation, O oh Allah? Allah, you put me in this situation. And the very fact that you are able to put me in this situation means you can take me out of this situation as well. So this is a sabak that we learn, that whenever we have difficulties, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. And the right of Allah demands that you should not engage in any sin. This is the huququllah, you should never disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that you must restrain yourself from sin as much as possible. That even this little pleasure, he might have some pleasure for one night, for a few hours, or for a few minutes, but that's going to lead to a greater harm for him. And what's the point? For us also, Allah is reminding us, what's the point? You're going to have some maza, but the consequences are going to be great for you in this world and the life to come. And we will see 
that when a person controls their desires, what Allah gives them, we'll see this as well, inshallah. So even by reasoning, again, reasoning in the Quran, your reason tells you that small pleasures, a little bit of pleasure, is not worth it when it comes to a greater loss. You make this moral calculation in your mind, don't you? When a child is young, when you have a daughter like me, and you say to your daughter, Sophia, Khadija, Hala, you know, if you have this, if you have this lolly now, then you will get one. If you wait for another day, you'll have two. What will you do? They'll want it now. They'll want it now because their, their reasoning skills haven't quite developed yet. But when you get older, you realize, no, if I have an investment opportunity and somebody says, you know, if you invest in this stock and you want the returns, dividends now, you'll get this much, maybe two pounds. But wait a week, you'll get 200 pounds. What are you going to do? 200 pounds, because unless you're reason not a reasonable person, a reasonable person will do this. So reason tells you that you don't want to lose out for small gains when you can get a greater gain later on, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. And then the second thing, ma'adh Allah, and then what does he say? Innahu rabbi ahsana maswai. The prophetic way is that after he sees this, he recognizes himself and he gives admonishment to her. He gives nasiha to her that don't do this. Don't do this. So he's, the second thing is first he turns to Allah, then he acts in the world. The reason I'm mentioning this is sometimes people think that we should just seek Allah's help. No, we should also try and do something to change the situation that we are in. We should try and find a solution to our problem. Ma'az Allah, then he says, Innahu Rabbi Ahsana Maswai, my master, it's not right that I should betray my master who's taken good care of me. So he reminds himself and he reminds her that I'm here for a reason, a specific reason. Let's not violate that right of his. Let's not betray his trust. So this is the second thing. And the third thing in this very part here, Hukukul Ibad. His right is that I should serve him. His right is that I should honor him. I should do my tasks that I've agreed to do for him and nothing more. I should not betray his rights. Can you see? Hukukul Ibad, my friends, for those of you who study fiqh or interest in Sharia studies, is fundamental to the Sharia, the rights of fellow human beings. It's a non negotiable. It's, part of, it's fundamentally part of our Sharia, human rights, human dignity. So he recognizes. His master too. What a beautiful verse, isn't it already? We haven't even finished with the verse. We haven't even finished with the verse. He recognizes Allah's help. He needs Allah's help. Then he says to her, he gives her nasiha, don't do this. And the way he gives her nasiha is, look, this is not good to do. And we are betraying the rights of another human being. In this one phrase, you see the huququllah and huququl ibad all together. In this one phrase, innahu rabbi ahsana maswai, innahu laif lihu. Zalimun. It's a reminder, my friends, because this verse isn't just about Yusuf and Zuleika and his master. It's about us. Allah's, Allah's talking to us. He's reminding us that you will find yourself in a world that you didn't choose to be in. You didn't choose to live in the 21st century. You could have lived. And we, many times we romanticize that. I wish I was living during the caliphate. I was living during the time of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Or maybe Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala, of course, that would have been great. Or the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or Mehmed the second or somebody else. But Allah chose us for us to be in the world at this moment in time. That's his choice. We have no say in the matter. We can't shape or decide how Allah wants us to come into this world. But what we can do, subhanAllah, listen to this. What we can do is respond to the circumstances that we find ourselves in. That's where the test of Allah comes. How do you respond to what and the situation that Allah has placed you in? Number one, like Yusuf salam, when we are in difficulty, we turn to the maker of the world, the one who created this world and put you in this situation. Then you give nasiha as you can to people. Say, look, brother, sister, this is not how we should be behaving. You should, this is not how we should behave. And then if they don't listen, you leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, you should make sure that you don't violate the rights of other people. Remind people that the sin that we're doing is harming other people. It's taking away the rights of fellow human beings. This is why 
The Sharia is all about recognizing the rights of other people. When you stand in Salah, when you stand in Salah, you stand next to your brother, shoulder to shoulder, reminding you they have rights over you and you have rights over them. When an Imam leads the prayer, even though he's praying to Allah, he's not supposed to pray too long, the Jama'ah. Why? Naeem might have to go to work afterwards. Muhammad might be uh, tired today. Hmm? Somebody else might be old and weak. Keep it short. Sunnah, Nawafil, pray as long as you want because that's between you and Allah. But when it comes to the Jama'ah, keep it short and sweet. Especially when Isha is at 11 o'clock and people have to go work half past six in the morning. Hmm? This is the wisdom of the Sharia. It's the haq of Allah. But at the same time, huqoqul ibad. You'll find this throughout the Sharia time and time again. Time and time again. In Hanafi Mazhab, when they talk about when's the best time to have Jama'ah, when's the best time to have Jama'ah, you know, when Fajr, Isha, Maghrib, they say there's difference of opinions, but the main Jama'ah, the best time to have it is what's unfa'l in nas, what's best for people, what works for best for people. Can you see? It's huqoqullah. Namaz is between you and Allah. But at the same time, the fuqaha say, don't forget the rights of fellow human beings. And this is all taken from the Quran. Subhanallah. And look at the next verse. 24. Subhanallah. I'm going to translate this as best as I can. And in Arabic, I'll try and explain the meaning to you. She certainly desired him. I've included the word certainly. Pay attention. And he had desired her. There's laqad. Ali, you done laqad? No. Oh, okay. So laqad is emphasizing. Look, sh- look at Arabic. Walaqad hammad. She desired him. Laqad means she certainly desired him. But when he says for Yusuf, السلام, Allah says, wahamma biha. And he desired her. There's no certainly here. I'll come back to this in a moment. It's a, it's a very uh, delicate thing Allah mentioned in the Quran. You can easily miss it. But Allah is making a very, very subtle point here. So he, she certainly desired him and he had desired her, had he not seen a sign from his Lord. This is how we kept evil and indecency away from him, for he was truly one of our chosen servants. This verse here, among many verses in the Quran, proves that the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of them, are protected from minor and major sins. I'll show you in a moment. Because when you read this verse, without knowing kalam, theology, fiqh, you'll be like, did Yusuf really, was he really tempted towards her? How could a prophet of Allah be tempted towards her? Right? So we'll, we'll go to this in a moment. One thing you have to understand in the Sharia, or fuqaha, mashallah, I've understood this, is that we are not held accountable. Listen to this very carefully. Careful. We are not held accountable for non-voluntary faults. If something comes into your heart, in your mind, and you had no intention about it, an evil thought or a mind, you're not held accountable for that until you act upon it. This is Rahmah of the Sharia. So sometimes people have waswasa. They come to me, Malana, you know, I get these evil inspirations and this, 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 this. I say, wait, just praise God, you're not held accountable for it. Because in our Sharia, you're only held accountable for something that you do. Not that you have, you don't have control over it. So how would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as your Lord who is merciful would, would want to hold you accountable? And in fact, they are forgiven. There are many hadiths to that point to this. I'll share one with you from Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim. They say, um, from Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they say that Allah says, so Allah, Rasul is saying that Allah says, إِذَا أَرَادَ عَبَدِي إِذَا أَرَادَ عَبْدِي أَنْ يَعْمَلَ سَيِّئَةً when my slave intends to do an evil act, فَلَا تَكْتُبُوهَا Don't write it down. Don't write it down. حَتَّى يَعْمَلَهَا Until he does it. In other words, don't keep the pen away from writing it down. فَإِنْ عَمِلَهَا فَكْتُبُوهَا بِمِثْلِهَا If he does do it, write down one bad deed for him. If he does it, write down one bad deed for him. وَإِنْ تَرَكَهَا مِنْ أَجْلِ فَكْتُبُوهَا لَهُ حَسْنَةً And if he leaves it for my... For because of me, then write down one good deed for him. وَإِذَا أَرَادَ أَنْ يَعْمَلَ حَسْنَةً Look at this. When he intends to do one good deed, and for some reason, فَلَمْ يَعْمَلْهَا He's not able to do it. Write it down for him anyway. Write it down for him. لِكْدُو 
just by your intention to do something good, Allah says, write it down. But when it comes to intention to do something bad, Allah says, don't write it down until He does the act. Look how just and merciful my Allah and your Allah is. But it gets better. If He does do the good act, He's been given tawfiq. <clears throat> and remember, you know, we can get into the deep details of this. Even when you do something good, by the way, it's not from you, it's from Allah. And for that, you should be grateful too. And for that, you should be grateful too. And for that, you should be grateful. How are you going to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Even when you do something good, it's nothing from you. Allah gave you the tawfiq to do it. You should be grateful for the tawfiq. But you should also be given, you should be also grateful for the tawfiq that He gave you. Can you see? So how, how this is why you'll never be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as is His due. فَإِنْ عَمِلَهَا فَاكْتُبُوهَا If He does that good deed, then write for Him بِعَشْرِ أَمْثَالِهِ At least 10. Minimum 10. Minimum 10. إِلَى سَبْعِمْيَا until 700, depending on how sincere and other, other factors. So when you have an evil waswasa or evil thought, don't worry about it. It's passing. Just make zikr, make istighfar, and let it go. This is the beautiful uh, appreciation of the Qur'an. I also want to, because you're listening, mashallah, attentively, I want to make a subtle Qur'anic point here as well. Of the verse. This is why I want you to have the Quran in front of you because it's beautiful. You'll see it. Even if you don't know Arabic, you'll see it now. And inshallah, for the rest of your life, when you come across this verse, you'll remember this point. I call this, I've, I've phrased it in my writing, the case of the two hums. The case of the two hums. you see that you'll see the play of words in a moment, inshallah ta'ala. I like to mix Arabic and English together. Okay. There's a linguistic subtlety here. If you go to the verse 24 in front of you, the word hum. In the Quran, وَلَقَدْ هَمَّدْ بِهِ She certainly desired him. Has been attributed to both of them. Because Allah uses the word twice. It's a verb. She desired him and he had desired her. The English doesn't really capture the real thing that's going on here. I'll explain to you. But there's a big difference here. Now if you think about it, Allah could have said, He could have used the jewel, هَمَّهُمَا That they both desired each other. Allah could have said, they both desired each other. He desired she desired him and he desired her. Allah could have used a jewel. But Allah separates her desire and Allah separates his de desire. Does that make sense? Yeah? There's a reason why Allah does that. There's a reason why Allah does that. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ هَمَّدْ بِهِ وَهَمَّ بِهَا Hum is joined with the word laqad. Look at the word in the Quran. وَلَقَدْ Can you see laqad? Let me explain something to you. The, the word lamb, you don't need to be an expert in Arabic. May I go some jaw? The one when he talks about Zuleika, Allah uses the word laqad. When he's talking about Yusuf, there's no laqad. The word laqad, or lamb and qad, qad, it comes for emphasis. The lamb is called lamul ibtida in grammar, and the qad is called harfu tahqiq. So Allah is double emphasizing something that she des certainly desired him. But when it comes to Yusuf, what does Allah say? وَهَمَّ بِهَا Can you see? Can you see? There's a fark. Jama Sahih. Yeah, there's a difference. The first one is intention. The second one is the hum. Yeah, that's right. So this is very important because this is where people misunderstand things because they don't read the Arabic very, very carefully. So there's a, what I would say, Jama, it's a qualitative difference as well. There's a qualitative difference. She certainly desired him. She, she had desire for him. For him, it was just non-voluntary. There was no lust or desire when it came from Yusuf alayhi salatu salam. This is very, very important. Does this make sense? This is barik. Like if you don't read the Quran very, very carefully, you miss this point. So even in the language of the Quran, this point is made. Allah absolves Yusuf alayhi salatu salam. Does that make sense? So it, was just a, it was just a fleeting thing and that was, and Allah doesn't hold you, hold you accountable, like I said before, for anything that's fleeting. But she had laqad, she did definitely desired Yusuf alayhi salatu salam. So this is important. وَهَمَّ بِهَا لَوْ لَا أَرَّآ بُرْحَانَ رَبِّي كَذَلِكَ لِنَسْرِفَ عَنْهُ السُّوءَ وَالْفَحْشَاء Allah says that we turned away from him, the su and the wal-fahsha. What did Yusuf alayhi salatu salam see? What was it that he saw that made him alert again that no no this is you know I need to I, I can't get involved in all of this. We're not really told in the Quran. Allah doesn't tell us what he saw. Lawla Arra Burhana Rabbi. Many ulama write about what he saw. Some say he saw his father, some say he saw other things. 
But the Quran doesn't really tell us. The muhaddisin, the mufassirin will tell us things. So I'm not really going into it because it's all speculation and we don't need to get into it. But he saw something that intervened. Now this is very, very important. When you love Allah and you really want to please Allah and you're doing all the things that you can to please Allah, ma'az Allah, fulfilling rights of other people, being a good human being, Allah will intervene on your behalf. Allah will make things happen for you that you did not even anticipate. So, وَهَمَّ بِهَا لَوْ لَا أَرَّعَ بُرْحَانَ رَبِّهِ كَذَلِكَ لِنَصْرِفَ عَنْهُ السُّوءَ وَالْفَحْشَى Allah uses two words here, سوء and والفحشة. سوء refers to minor sins. So Allah protected him from minor sins. And والفحشة also requires, means major sins. Or سوء means like the initial um, prerequisites of sin. So if somebody wants to do zina, for example, there are stages to zina, the touching, the texting, whatever it may be. And fahsha is the end result of zina, the effect of it. So Allah protected Yusuf from both of them, i.e. from minor sins, major sins, or the muqaddamat, any sort of like beginnings of zina. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ zina." Don't even go near it. Don't go near temptation. This is important. It's also very, very interesting. And look in the Quran again. كَذَلِكَ لِنَصْرِفَ عَنْهُ السُّوءَ وَالْفَحْشَى Allah says that it was me. لِنَصْرِفَ Allah is the one who had intervened and saved Yusuf alayhi salatu salam, not himself. In other words, it was me. لِنَصْرِفَ عَنْهُ عَنْهُ Allah saved Yusuf alayhi salatu salam, not himself. It wasn't anything from Yusuf alayhi salatu salam. In other words, Allah protected Nabiyina Yusuf alayhi salatu salam. When he was surrounded by evil, when he was surrounded by indecency, Allah intervened. Allah protected Yusuf alayhi salatu salam. And who can be a greater protector, a better protector than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Again, it's showing this idea that there was nothing in Yusuf alayhi salam that was evil, but Allah protected. Allah had, is, he had isma. He was protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very, very important. Otherwise, Allah could have said, we, Allah would have said that it was we saved Joseph from sin. Allah could have said that. Uh, or we kept him from evil and decency. No, it wasn't like that. Allah said, we protected ourselves, Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. And then I want to end with something very, very interesting. I'll give you a reference for this because there might be ulama who want to listen to this. And I always have to keep my receipts, as I say. In Mafatih al Ghaib, Imam Razi makes a very barik point, very latif point. In the end, what does Allah say? إِنَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا الْمُخْلَسِينَ I'll end with this, insha'Allah ta'ala. He is from, I mean, this can be read with uh, two, two, two versions, mukhlis or mukhlas, uh, as a ismi fa'il, ismi fool, but I'm not going to go into that. إِنَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا الْمُخْلَسِينَ He is from our sincere servants, chosen servants. Imam Razi, in his Mafatih al-Ghayb, it's a masterpiece, he says that, um, not only does this show that Yusuf والسلام, is pure from any sin or immorality, um, but he, he puts the words in the mouth of Iblis to defend Yusuf. والسلام. What does he do? Let me repeat that back to you. He uses the words of Iblis, may Allah curse him, to defend who? Yusuf والسلام. in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says elsewhere, قَالَ فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَسِينَ Shaitan, when he was challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is before, he said, by your glory, I will certainly mislead all of your servants, all of them, أجمعين, except, then Iblis made an exception, he said, except among your Chosen servants. In there he says mukhlasin. And what's in that verse at the end? So Imam Razi is saying, look, even Iblis is recognizing that when you are mukhlis, when you are chosen by Allah, because it could be mukhlas as well, when you are chosen by Allah or you are sincere to Allah, then nothing can harm you. Hmm? So Shaitan himself acknowledged that he cannot mislead those who are chosen and indeed, Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam is from the chosen people by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sincerity, being chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being, des being deserving of those who are chosen by Allah, is a means of protection from deception. Protection from deception.
from deception. So we learn a few things here and I'll conclude insha'Allah ta'ala. And it, you know, this isn't just for entertainment. This is for our own life, our own hidayah. Just these two verses today. Is that look, whenever Allah tests you, and He will definitely test you, whether it's, I, was, I went to meet a family member in Gloucester just a few days ago. She found out she had cancer. So I went to my mom and dad to visit her. You know, and I said to Allah's testing you. You have to remain patient. But then you also have to go to the doctor and do the chemotherapy and everything else. And this is part of Islam. You have to do ilaj. First, you turn to Allah. You seek Allah's help. You know that Allah is doing this and Allah knows best what's for you. But you also have to use the asbab that right? Allah has given to you to try and help yourself. Right? But at the same time, you make sure that you live a life where you are completely content with Allah. Whatever Allah decrees, whatever Allah wishes for me, that's good for me. And I'm not unhappy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I don't know the wisdom behind what's happening to me right now. I don't know the real story. Think of yourself as Yusuf alayhi salam now. We haven't finished the story yet. We're still in this section where you know what's going to happen now to him. He's going to get accusations aimed at him because she's going to say, well, he tried to do something to me. When as we know in the Quran, he was innocent. So he's going to get into more trouble. But he's going to remain patient. And Allah later on will absolve him. So we'll be tested. We'll find halat in the world. But we must respond to them. Like I mentioned to you before, if someone's rights are being taken away, if something wrong is happening in our community or in our masajid, in our towns, someone's taking rights away from somebody else, you can't say, oh, Maulana, this is the qadr of Allah. No, that's stupidity. You must respond. You must do something. If someone's rights is being taken away, then you are responsible to act in the world. Allah will ask you that you saw something wrong in the world and you didn't respond, either through saying something, either through trying to stop it with your hands, or at least in your heart you try to change things. Like Yaqub when he first hears about what happened, he couldn't do anything, so he just said, for sovereign Jamil. But later on, we'll see that he was able to now act. So according to your circumstance, you try and do something. You turn to Allah, you also remind people, that, look, don't do these things. It's not good to do this. This is not the way of Muslims. We don't betray people. We don't uh, dishonor people. We maintain the dignity of people. And at the same time, we always make, make sure that we have the highest levels of akhlaq. Right? We should never... Remember this, if our enemies and the people don't like us use bad tactics, that doesn't justify that we should bad tactics. We shouldn't use their dirty tactics. We shouldn't become immoral like they do. We should always raise, raise the bar and become better people. You see this throughout the story of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. But here you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects his mukhlis people. He chooses certain people. So ask Allah, ask Allah my friends, to make you from those people. That he chose you, he chooses you, he selects you. Because Allah chooses you. Allah wants you to do something, it's a gift. If you're doing khidmat of deen, whether it's through ta'aleem, tadris, tabligh, it's a gift that Allah has given to you. He's chosen you. Nothing from us. I don't deserve to be here. You don't deserve to be here. Allah chose us. That's a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it comes with responsibilities. When Allah chooses you, he's going to protect you as well. He's going to make it happen for you. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those mukhlisin because shaitan cannot harm illa ibadaka min humul mukhlisin. I can't do anything to these people who are mukhlis, who turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us and to guide us and give us two faham of the Qur'an.